Hi everyone, my name is Metalia. If you hadn't already known, I have a YouTube channel called The Misguided Pilgrim. Um, so I just want to give a brief overview of what has happened in the last few days. So, well, really in the past few weeks, I have been preparing for my talk yesterday on the Christianization of Europe over in Zoom in the Sea of Faith Melbourne or philosophy group where we discuss um, religion, um, different points of view about religion, politics, and overall Western philosophy. So um, I was like initially, I was initially going to um, record the talk, but unfortunately because of tech issues, I wasn't able to. So I'm going to be presenting again um, the topic Christianization of Europe. Um, in this recording, which I will upload in YouTube later on. So I'm going to be doing like a 15 minute, approximately 15 minute introduction of myself and my background. I'm treating it like it's the presentation again, and followed by 30 minutes of the actual content of the topic. So as you already know, I'm Natalia. Um, I'm currently studying in the Australian Catholic University, or ACU for short, in Melbourne, Australia, or the Masters of Teaching for Early Childhood and Primary. Prior to that, in 2017, I did foundational studies of art and design, followed by three years of bachelor's degree in animation, and finally settled on decision, the decision to study theology. The graduate diploma of theology in the University of Divinity or a um, theological school, the Trinity Theologi Theological School. Um, so, before I describe um, my decision in changing my pursuits of studies, I'm just going to be briefly describing my background and how I came across Western philosophy, which led me to studying theology. So I was raised um, in a religious environment where my parents are Buddhist and they encourage me, they would take me to Sunday school, like a Buddhist Sunday school and encourage me to listen to the Dhamma, you know, or the teaching of the Buddha, um, which were taught by the, the staff there, you know. And I, my parents, my parents are also, you know, pretty, pretty astute and they're very strong-willed in, re in retaining their Chinese customs or heritage or tradition where I'd have to um, pray to the ancestors, you know, once, once a year, um, as well as serving offerings, giving offerings to the altar of a pagan god belonging to a Chinese folk tradition. So it wasn't just that, but there is an element in Chinese tradition or a Chinese belief where I had to respect my elders, you know, and prioritize my parents or those in authority. I have to prioritize their needs first before myself, because that was the default belief that us Chinese would need to um, hold. Um, so without going into further detail, I'm just going to be moving on towards like how I came into contact with Christianity. So I first, um, my parents enrolled me. My parents enrolled me in a Catholic and Protestant school. Firstly, from kindergarten to year three and the letter from year four to secondary four are the equivalent to year 10. So my parents believed that in order for me to be literate, they believed that enrolling me in an English speaking school with Chinese as a second language, and mind you that I'm in, that I was in Indonesia. So I'm sort of like, exposed to these multicultural influences, you know, where um, I'm culturally 
a little bit Indonesian and Chinese as well, because I was born and raised in Indonesia. And so um, my parents still wanted me to study deeper, to, to deepen my knowledge, you know, or study the language about, about you know, Chinese culture, about, of Chinese, basically. And so in the end, I can't say that I, you know, regret studying in an English speaking school. Well, most of these English speaking schools that I went to, um, and even those, the other speaking schools in Indonesia would tend to be Christian. And I can't say that I was ungrateful for it because I, I learned a few Western literature, um, popular Western literature, which were incorporated in the subjects of art, humanities, and English. So my least favorite subject was math because my brain, my young brain at the time in adolescence or even younger adolescents couldn't deal with structured thinking that well, you know, not until I came across Western philosophy, of course, because um, I was pretty much into arts and that. So, after graduating from year 10, I decided to move to Melbourne to pursue my studies in arts. Well, specifically animation, because I was into Japanese cartoons for quite a while. And I still am, but just not very, um, just, you know, a casual fan, really. So uh, it, it, it was a bit to my dismay. It, it disappointed me um, because I realized that I had unmatched unmatched expectations um, of the animation course, as well as the difference in my viewpoints, you know, my, my point of views with the classmates who graduated just from high school. And the minds, you know, the, the, the way my classmates behaved were sort of like political activists, you know, they're involved so much in exploring issues of the world, such as inequality, um, global issues, you know, like feminism, environmentalism. And they use animation as a means to project their concern, to express their values. In other words, they wanted to, um, I wouldn't say revolutionize, but, but they're trying to propagate their views, you see, in an attempt to convince others um, to believe in the same things that they do. And this was imposing for me from coming from a conservative upbringing. Um, I was raised to accept things the way they are. And if I questioned them, it would sort of be considered an, an act of rebellion, just like how if I were to question my elders' traditions, um, it would sort of be considered an act of rebellion, you know. So I didn't, I really didn't feel like there was a sense of individuality, you know, I couldn't really express myself that well. And it triggered a feeling of isolation in me. It led me to question my, the values of my upbringing, as well as the purpose of my existence. And Frankly speaking, I enjoyed my time studying theology more <laughs> because classmates that I met, they were, you know, in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, or even 60s. And they, they were very different in the sense that they had already discovered, they had already discovered their a sense of vocation. a sense of vocation in this, in their case, in partaking the ministry of God, the ministry to serve Christ by becoming a seminarian, you know, by engaging in pastoral care, um, contributing to the church, the, the, uh, the development of the church, be it Anglican or Catholic, you know, because I did go to a, an, a Catholic and an Anglican camp. still doing my course. So I studied the introduction to the Old Testament, introduction to church history, as well as Christian ethics. So exploring 
issues about the world, you know, political issues, and using theology, using the um, a divine basis for justifying our beliefs, you know, justifying our theories. Um, so it made me realize that so far I've only spent my teenage years, you know, liking the simple things like liking art, design, well, my favorite cartoons, music, travel. And that's not to say that there are bad things, but I wanted to do something more than that. You know, I, I decided that I wanted to deepen my analytical skills. So biblical studies, you know, the study of Christian theology and philosophy is very much um, triggered from that feeling. Um, even though it was, even though it is a different religion to where I was raised and to, yeah, to the one that I was brought up with, there's something about the Christian religion which attracts me. Um, I think it is sort of like the, the you know, the, I don't know how to describe it, but there's an, a strong, very strong symbolisms, you know, in the, in the religion and the fact that suffering to some people is seen as a, you know, that the Christ, Christ crucifixion is romanticized. But to me, I do feel like there is a deeper meaning behind that, you know, like, like Jesus is just a human being. And we all, we all know that, that even though he was fully man, fully God, even though he was God, but yet he also retains his human emotions and his goal in on earth, you know, is to develop and cultivate those emotions. Hence, that was why he's, persona, his persona is relatable to his followers. And, you know, he's able to convince people to follow him, to preach the gospels, the truth or the word of God. But yeah, anyway, um, around, around the same time in mid 2018, I came across the um, agnostics group, which is held by the host or the moderator of the group that I was uh, presenting for, um, David Miller. So for those of you in Melbourne, you might have heard of him because he held the existentialist society groups physically. It used to be held physically. And the agnostics group is just like held once a month in the Unitarian Hall um, in Melbourne. So I realized that I too share a common concern with the philosophers, you know, the the drive to discover and question meaning and how Christian theology inspired philosophers like Immanuel Kant, Kierkegaard. And since we are diving into the field of the supernatural, it's all about studying the origins and myths of theology, you know, of how the Christian belief came about. Not to form a prejudice against it, but to transform those origins and myths into a foundational understanding of reality. So, you know, my, my, my transition from a religiously dominated culture to a free thinking lifestyle in the West really enabled me to question whether having faith or no faith in a God or gods would make me a lesser person and whether assimilating in culture is the best way to make meaning in my life. So as theology is incorporated, um, is sort of like correlated with philosophy, Western philosophy, and it has formed quite a big part in the development of Western culture. Um, I figured that it is very important to study it, to challenge our ideas about the human persona, politics, science, our values, you know. And it, it would allow me to better understand the purpose of our, of human, um, human creation, you know, the image, our human image, and 
how we are sort of codependent with other beings on Earth. So anyway, um, as a topic I will present deals with the Christianization of Europe, I will just outline a few important points um, in the first 1,000 years of Christian history. First, Paul's mission to the Roman Empire, how Constantine changed the fate of Christianity, Arianism, a particular Christian heresy that was quite prevalent during time, the fourth century, um, the conversion of the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons in Britain, and the East and West schism of the church in 1054 AD. So I'll just be presenting my slides. I'll share my screen. All right, there we go. How do I present this slideshow? Okay, the Christianization of Europe. So first of all, I'd like to just introduce the topic, starting off, start off by asking you guys, what is the term Christian? What does it mean to be Christian? So the term Christian was first used in the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 26, to describe Paul's disciples in Antioch. Just give me a sec. I'm just going to find the um, chapter. There it is. So on verse 26, it says, and when, and when Barnabas, Paul's companion, found Paul, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for an entire year, they associated with the church and taught a great many people. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. So it's important to note that the word church at this time wasn't really referring to an actual church, you know, um, because there were still plenty of synagogues. Judaism was still the dominant religion and the Christians was still um, a, min a minority, you know, the belief in the coming of the Messiah to save humankind from their sins. So church means an assembly of Christians or a congregation of believers in, of the Christian religion. So these people are distinct. Uh, well, the new Christians were sort of like a sect of traditional Judaism. They're distinct. Traditional Judaism believes that God speaks through the prophets like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and forms a covenant with those prophets and using, utilizing um, the prophets, utilizing might not be a good word, but the prophets would form a covenant with the people by preaching the word of God in order for them to be able to reach closer to God and attain eternal salvation. They never really elaborated on the Messiah or Christ, really, because it was simply... Um, sort of the belief where God was the main focus, you know, God's, um, uh, they, they were living sort of like by the, by the Mosaic law, where God was the main focus, you know, his commandments were the, um, sort of the default commandments to follow. So being a Christian, um, in the first to the second century was to fight against all forms of oppression, particularly of Roman imperialism, and standing up for one's beliefs, even if it means becoming a martyr to persecution. So 
it was pretty dangerous to be um, a Christian at this time, especially if you're outspoken. Um, even the Jews who practiced Judaism as their religion were under formal protections from the Roman Empire. While the Christians who were still a minority, they weren't under legal protections. Worship was private and occasionally they would be charged by with accusations of heresy, you know, of sorcery, of cannibalism even, and blood consumption, black magic, you name it. So they've, you know, early Christian martyrs, executions of early Christian martyrs have occurred um, since the time of Apostle James um, in reference to Acts chapter 12, verse two, Apostle Matthew, Peter, followed by the series of Jewish Christian persecutions, which took place under the Roman emperors, Nero, um, famous for the Jewish revolt, if you've heard of that, um, in the year 66 to 67 AD, um, Decian persecution and the Diocletian persecution, or the great persecution, which was said to be the most deadly, where he imposed rules or edicts such as the confiscation of burning and burning of property from the church or clergy. And men, women, children, and these clergymen were imprisoned and forced to make sacrificial offerings to the Roman gods. So they weren't given any rights at all at this time, um, which was pretty common. So Jesus warns his disciples about persecutions already in Matthew chapter 10, verse 17 to 20. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and vlog you in their synagogues. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak and what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of the Father is speaking through you. So, there's, if you notice, there is a bit of an irony within these verses because it seems like martyrdom is being glorified. You know, Jesus was telling his disciples to not worry, you know, but, you know, to stand firm with the spirit um, because for those of you who were astute, staunch believers in, the, in God, in the Father, you must not be afraid of any malice or oppression. And this has become a virtue in the Christian religion. Martyrdom has become a virtue. It is the ability to remain steadfast in the presence of malice, oppression, and to stand up for your beliefs in Christ until the very end of your life. So this is just a um, short historical context of what happened and how Christianity emerged. So Christianity emerged in the first century AD in the Roman province of Judea, practiced by Orthodox Jews who observed the Sabbath, Passover, etc. So after the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, there were no followers of original Judaism. At the time, the Jews were already um, taken captive by the Assyrians, um, Babylonians. They, they would be transported to Assyria, Babylonia, um, in Egypt, or even Greece, you know. Hellenized, Helen, Hellenic or Hellenization is just a term where, you know, Greek culture started to flourish. So most of the Jews were Hellenized, meaning that they would have already been um, influenced by Greek culture, the, most of the Jews would um, be able to speak Greek, you know, and they wouldn't want to even identify with Israel because that was a, a national identity, you see. So now we're going to be just, I'm going to be presenting a little bit about Paul's three missionary journeys 
in Acts chapter 13, verse 20, along with his companion Barnabas and Mark the Evangelist, or John Mark, when they brought Jesus' Gospels out of Jerusalem. So, um, it's a little bit hard to process this map, but as you can see, um, and based on Paul's first missionary journey, it occurred between the year 46 to 49 AD, according to Acts chapter 11, 26, towards Antioch in the city of Syria. So it's right there. Because at that time, um, well, Antioch, there were two cities of Antioch, one in Pisidia, which is later going to be summarized in Acts chapter 13. But this particular um, city of Antioch is Syria. So it's different. And that was when Paul's disciples were first called Christians. In the first mission, Paul also went to a few places in Acts chapter 13 to 14, including Cyprus, Pamphylia, Phrygia, Lyconia, and then back to Antioch. So this was when Mark the Evangelist joined the company. Um, when he accompanied Paul and Barnabas to visit the Jewish synagogues of Salamis in Cyprus. He, he knew a relative of Barnabas there, so it was familiar to them. Later in Pamphylia, John Mark left the mission, leaving Paul and Barnabas to visit the synagogues in Antioch of Pisidia, Pisidia sorry, in Acts chapter 13, converting the Gentiles who were willing to hear the word of God. Paul's second missionary journey in Acts chapter 16, verse 23 to 32, chapter 20, verse 38, included Lyconia, Phrygia, Galatia, Asia, Macedonia, and Achaia. So the objective of the second trip entailed Paul sharing the news from the Council of Jerusalem on whether the Gentile Christians were supposed to be circumcised in accordance to the Mosaic law, in order to be safe. According to author Diarmate McCullough, this particular audience of Paul were referred to the God reveres or the Theosophies, for they were knowledgeable enough about Judaism to appreciate Paul's references to Jewish sacred literature. So Paul being a new Christian, the minority of the the minority Christian. He believed that an intimate meeting with Christ was most righteous. Although he had, um, he still to a degree believed strongly in following the law because the law is also part of God's commandments. It was written clearly as part of the Tanakh that circumcision was necessary in order for you to be an alleged, well, a Christian. So now we're gonna move on to Paul's third missionary journey, which was entailed in Acts chapter two, sorry, chapter 18, verse 23 to chapter 20, verse 38. Paul returned to Phrygia and Galatia, then Asia, followed by Macedonia to the rest of Greece, including Thessalonica. Interestingly enough, oh, sorry, I've already discussed that. I was just, um, this is just script relating how in chapter 18, um, verse 22, when Paul landed in Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and when he greeted the church and then he went back to Antioch again. So the congregation of Christians, as I have elaborated earlier, they were united by baptism and the Holy Spirit, which is what makes them really distinct, um, you know, and perhaps even um, a threat to the Roman government from the way, from the manner, from their outspoken manner. 
So, there's a hint somewhere in Romans chapter 15, verse 24, where Paul, some scholars predicted, had a possible journey to Spain. The early church father of Constantinople, John Chrysostom, mentioned in one of his writings that Paul had preached in Spain. For after he had been in Rome, he returned to Spain, but whether he came thence again into these parts, we know not. Cyril of Alexandria also noted that Paul fully preached the gospel in imperial Rome and Spain, performing wonders and signs or miracles. So this was this was the um, this is just an alternate theory, really. But moving on, we're gonna be looking at the changing fate of Christianity in classical antiquity, which I believed um, happened. Um, well, the classical antiquity started from eighth century BC till the fifth century AD. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the period that I have so far understood. So why is Constantine so important? Constantine the Great, born in 306 to 337 AD, established Christianity as a formal religion of the Roman Empire. When he went to battle against Emperor Maxentius at Milvian Bridge in 312 AD, he witnessed the sign of the Cairo or the cross in the sky, with a voice saying, in this sign, you will conquer. So there were conflicting theories that Constantine was never at all a Christian. and He was baptized by an Arian bishop, Eusebius of Nicomedia, um, which later happened before Constantine's death. And so, well, that's just some theories. We don't know for sure. But what was really important was the Edict of Milan in 313 AD that Constantine agreed on with Emperor Licinius when they agreed that there, they would make Christianity the legal religion of the empire. There was a period of toleration among pagans. Pagans were allowed to conduct private worship. Um, and the title Pontifex Maximus, which was used for originally the pagan high priests were allowed in the church. So as you can see there in the image, um, the symbol of the Cairo was painted on the shields of the soldiers. So Constantine started incorporating these, um, the symbol into his military um, congregation. Council of Nicaea in 325 AD was a bishopric congregation formed by Constantine when he established the Nicene Creed, as well as resolving the issue of Arianism. Now, this was one of the major events that marked the turning point of church history as well. When the, the Nicene Creed states, I believe in the one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, unsubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, it's important to note that phrase there, begotten, not made, because this phrase was a refutation against Bishop Arius, um, whose catchphrase entailed, there was a time when the Son was not. So there was a time when the son was a creature. He had a beginning. He was subject to time and change. Therefore, he subordinated to the father who's eternal. 
So it's important because if the son is made, then he wouldn't be eternal. But if he's begotten, then he was different. So Athanasius and Arius, Bishop Athanasius from Alexandria, refuted against Arius in validating Christ as the promissory model for the kingdom to come into redeeming humankind's sins and ensuring them a path towards eternal salvation. Humans cannot attain salvation if primacy is solely based on the Father, which is, of course, obvious in that sense. Christ is, in a sense, the mediator of the earthly life and the eternal, unchanging realm of God. So this period, um, the rise of Arianism in Central and Southeastern Europe is a prequel against the Germanic invasions, which later occurred in sometime around the fifth century. Uh, this is a complicated period because it happened during the fall, well, almost entering the fall of the Western Roman Empire. After Constantine's death at 37 AD, his son Constant Constantius II ruled the Roman Empire for 24 years. Constantius II issued laws such as the banning of pagan sacrifices, superstitions, and against Jews. So they were against Jews who owned slaves. They were against Jews who owned Christian slaves or who circumcised their own slaves. But for those who did that, would be subject to execution. Because Constantius II was a semi-Aryan, um, if you study a bit about church history, he's a bit like Emperor Valens, who's a semi-Aryan as well. A lot of the Roman, em uh, Roman emperors, surprisingly, or perhaps unsurprisingly, adopted the Aryan faith um, until later on during Theodosius' time, I see orthodoxy was enacted established as the official creed. So Constantius II's um, attempt to convene the Council of Ariminum and the Council of Constantinople was meant to validate Arianism as the de facto creed, or the main creed in 3, 000, sorry, 379 AD. And uh, we have Bishop Ulfilas, um, which was appointed by Eusebius of Nicomedia, Nicomedia, if you remember, I mentioned him earlier. Eusebius is the same bishop who, con who is said to have converted Constantine, Constantine into a Christian, but actually an, an Arian. Ophelas converted the Visigoths, or the gods from the Eastern continent from Spain, into the Arian faith. He was of Cappadocian Greek descent, so he was able to speak Greek, and he managed to translate the Greek Bible into the Gothic language. So that's an image of the Bible in the Gothic language, as you can see. He converted the gods in three, um, 341 AD. So the Germanic invasions, which came later in the 400s, they actually started, the Germanic invasions have commenced since 200 AD, but there were three official, three official um, battles that happened, um, such as the sack of Rome um, in 4110 AD, led by Visigothic king Alaric from the east. The second is another sack of Rome in 455 AD, led by the Vandals. And the third is the Battle of Ravenna, 476 AD, led by the Ostrogothic king Odoacer. That's actually the major one because it happened in the same year the Roman Empire collapsed. So gradually, these Germanic tribes, including the Franks, the Burgundians, and the Swabies, invaded Rome. And they sought refuge from the invading Huns, um, an Asiatic tribe who came from the steeps. So if you remember my mentioning of Emperor Valens, Emperor Valens, Emperor Valens is a semi-Aryan, 
but he was he and Constantius the second. I don't know whether they make a pact or not, but um, from what I can recall, Valens gave um, the Visigoths the permission to cross the Danube River into Rome. And so, sorry, um, that's actually different. Um, so they allowed the, these Gothic tribes to come into the empire, the Roman empire, and under the condition that they have to convert to the Aryan faith, because, because it suited the ruling caste of these tribes. You know, they, there was a theory that some of them were even already Christian even before they were converted into Aryanism. So they were given refuge, in other words. The Franks were the first Germanic tribe who converted to Nicene Catholicism in 498 AD. Um, Gaul, Netherlands, Germany, by Clovis I, founder of the Merovingian dynasty, who converted to Catholicism in 496 AD. This, this was later on, but at around the, the late 400s, um, that was when Nicene Catholicism came enacted as the, as the creed, as I will be mentioning in my next slide, um, established by Emperor Theodosius I, reigned 379 to 395 AD in his Edict of Thessalonica in 380 AD. He was the one who held the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, professing the Holy Trinity being equal to the Father and the Son. In the edict, he indirectly referred to the Arians as foolish madmen who would receive divine punishment for the belief they carried. His focus was initially on demolishing Christian heresies. Initially, he wasn't against pagans, but in the year 392 AD, he started banning private pagan worship, even to the point of destroying their temples. Ooh. So yes, as you can see, that's Theodosius's head and his face, his side profile on the Solidus coin. So this is just a map that I took a photo of from the Penguin Atlas of Medieval History, as you can see here. It's given by a friend of mine, very good friend of mine. Um, so I took a photo of the map in 528 AD, where you can see that uh, Nicene Orthodoxy was already established in Rome and Egypt. And you still have the remaining Germanic tribes who adopted Arianism. We have the four ecumenical councils of Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria, who were really ruled by patriarchates, and the papacy in Rome. All right. I just have a grab um, a cup of water before I move on because I'm a bit dehydrated. <laughs> Give me a sec. Okay, Christianization of Ireland in the fifth century was led by St. Patrick, the apostle of Ireland. Um, there was a story that even before St. Patrick was arrived in Ireland um, and converted the people, the Anglo, sorry, not the Anglo-Saxons, the Irish population in 432 AD, St. Saint, Saint Palladius, the preceding Bishop of Ireland already established monasteries, founded Celtic Christianity. So in a sense, St. Patrick was just finishing his mission that, that Palladius left behind. He further established monasteries, churches, and schools throughout Western and Northern Ireland. So the term Celtic Christianity was an integration of local Irish identity with elements of Catholicism. So we have some stories say the Druid prayer that was cited by a later Saint, Saint Columba, um, who came in the, I believe the sixth century in Iona where he founded the monasteries. 
and who also traveled to Scotland and Northumbria um, because it contained a bit of Celtic spirituality, which could he believed could be integrated in Celtic Christianity. And there was an um, Celtic or Irish architecture as well, such as the bells and crosses, which were distinct to the particular culture. And we have the formation of the scriptorium in the monasteries where monastics or monks would produce manuscripts. One of St. Patrick's popular works is the Confessio, Confessio, an autobiography of his conversion and spiritual journey in seeking God. And it was um, in one of the chapters of the Confessio, St. Patrick outlined um, his distress um, in the letter to the soldiers of Coroticus against the British harsh treatment of the Irish Christians. So St. Patrick did have a bit of sentiment against the uh, British government at the time. And, you know, in this sense, Celtic Christianity was still new, I believe. And not only that, I think that what's worth noting is that Ireland, compared to mainland Europe, had no central authority. It was still instead ruled by dynastic leaders called the Tuathas, or tribal groupings. In other words, the leaders were pagans who relied on supernatural powers to defend their crops and cattle from attacking opponents. St. Patrick had an idea one day where he would convince the Irish local chieftains that they will be sons and daughters of Christ. Hence, there forms a union of Christ's believers with the integration of local Irish identity. Next, we have the Gregorian mission in Christianizing Anglo-Saxon Britain. This was initiated by Pope Gregory I, also known as Gregory the Great, who survived um, between four, uh, 540 to 640 AD. He anointed Bishop Augustine of Canterbury as the leader of the mission. Augustine of Canterbury traveled and established the churches of St. Peter and Paul in Kent, Rochester, Canterbury. And I wasn't sure, but Ben Bernicia could be one of the um, places that he went to as well. And Wessex, perhaps? Wessex, yeah. I need a bit of study on that. But from what I know, Kent was the first place that he traveled to and successfully converted King Ethelbert and his subjects to Christians. He was the first Anglo-Saxon king to be baptized on Christmas Day in 597 AD, which in the end allowed Augustine to gain financial support to invest in land for building churches as well as the protection of church property. So that's an image of St. Augustine's Abbey in Canterbury. It looks nice, <laughs> very tranquil area. Um, because it was a hub for monastics, you know, um, or monks. Um, and as well as they had a college there uh, and a library, which uh, was found in 598 AD, provided manuscripts and books on classical philosophy. The next important event we have is the Synod of Whitby in 664 AD, conducted by King Oswiu of Northumbria. He reigned first in Bernicia in 642-670 AD in the Whitby Abbey. This was a particularly important, another important event in Christian history because he formed a discussion with other, with other Celtic Christian rulers in determining the proper date for Easter, whether it should follow the Roman tradition of the first Sunday or the 14th during the Passover. So Oswiu being, believing that St. Peter had a higher authority of the church and holding the keys to heaven, he decided to follow the Sunday Easter practice, um, disregarding the Celtic version, which is the 14th. 
Not only that, the, the synod also observed the tonsure customs for the monastics. Bishop Aidan of Lindisfarne concluded that since Rome had more ecclesiastical authority, tonsures were to be in accordance to Roman customs instead of the Celtic custom. So you can see how different that is in the Roman custom where the top of the head is bald and you have like a cut shave, very obvious cut there at the sides. Well, the Celtics just, you know, have that cut right in the middle of the top, head, but um, horizontal, framing the face. Okay, this is a bit irrelevant, well, not, not very relevant, but it's a bit of a drift from what we are discussing, but an important event in history, which was the Muslim invasions that occurred between 622 to 750 AD. We have the invasion, invasion of the Arab troops to the Eastern Empire. Constantinople as the main destination, from 674 to 678 AD, led by Caliph Muayyah I. Caliph means a Muslim military commander. So this, we had the two siege, the first and the second siege, which occurred in 672 AD. The second siege from 717 to 718 AD, both leading to Christian victory. But later, you know, as discussed in the Crusades, it led to an Islam victory, where eventually they took over Constantinople, renaming it to modern-day Istanbul. Hagia Sophia was turned into a mosque. Hagia Sophia was a really um, important hub for Christians, you see, a place of worship. So the Greek fire was used against the Arabs in the first siege. Um, and in the second siege, the Arabs crossed over the Thrace, subdued by Christians and Bulgars from Bulgaria. Okay, next, we have the alliance of the Frankish monarchs with the church. Pepin III, also known as Pepin the Short, reigned from 751 to 768 AD. He was the first king of the Carolingians who donated to Pope Stephen II at 756 AD on a strip of land in Italy, extending his rule over the Eastern Empire. So this is, this is important. This is an important event because you know, throughout the history of Christendom, papal authority had always been granted by the patriarch and the emperor of Constantinople. But by the 800s, there was an increasing alliance between the Franks and the Pope, especially during the time of Charlemagne, which we'll discuss later. So the Pope gained military support to the emperor. So as you can, as, as I have mentioned in this slide, there was increasing alliance during Charlemagne's time, such as the time when Charlemagne rushed to Pope, sorry, to Rome to assist Pope Adrian I during Rome's invasion of the barbarians in 772 AD. Next. Oh, actually, I forgot to make a point earlier. So that was an important period right after Charlemagne because it gave Christendom a new status where the Pope has its own military defender and is freed from the Eastern Church. So Charlemagne being an emperor who wanted to revive Rome from the collapse he wanted to um, improve the overall education of, the, of Europe, reviving it intellectually, culturally, and financially. But of course, plenty resisted, which led to the Saxon Wars, who wanted to retain their pagan heritage. Charlemagne conquered Lombardy, Lombardy, Bavaria, and other states of Germany between 772 to 804 AD. The last known massacre is what happened in Verdun in 782 AD, where a total of 4,500 Saxons were slaughtered. 
The first Viking invasion happened at Lindisfarne Monastery in 793 AD. Viking is simply a term that defines an occupation or raid, it doesn't refer to any sort of ethnicity. Monasteries were favorite places to collect loot. Vikings, in the end, reached Irish and Scottish territories by the 700s, after the Muslim invasions. And in 911 AD, finally, were permitted by Charles the Simple to stay in northern France, now known as Normandy. So that was where the term Normans came from, the Vikings who stayed in Normandy and spoke French, who gradually converted to Christianity from paganism. In 860 AD, Viking Rus, the Viking Rus or the Rus Vikings, Slavic Vikings, raided Constantinople during Arab attack on Byzantine walls. So Constantinople already had wars between, uh, with the Arabs it was already compromised in a compromised position. Until Vladimir the Great, from, I think, I think he was born or perhaps ruled from 980 to 1015 AD, his conversion to Christianity enabled the rest to follow. The rest converted to Christianity because of Vladimir the Great being Kievan Rus, or a Rus Viking as well. So that's just a map that I decided to put up um, for your curiosity and for your knowledge. We can see that Charlemagne's kingdom to 814 was already established um, in Bavaria, uh, Milan, Carinthia, Saxony, Ratisbon, um, and we have the Frankish Empire in 768, extending over Aquitaine, Gascony, Province, Burgundy, Alemania, Thuringia. And if you can see that purple, um, the highlighted area in purple, that's the Papal States or the states owned by the Pope in the strip of land that I was talking about in Italy, which included Rome and Ravenna. Next, we have another map of the Viking raids that happened between the 9th to 11th centuries. The Vikings originally came from Norway, Sweden, Denmark, the Scandinavian continent, all the way to Kiev, um, York, I think. Um, and yeah, around that area, Paris. Okay, the last section is the Great Schism in 1054 AD, which marked another particular important event in Christian history, which entailed the divide between the Western and Eastern churches or the Roman Catholic and the Greek Orthodox churches. So before this, this, this event was sort of like an accumulation. It was a peak event that was eventually going to happen, a pivotal point that marked the separation of the Western church and the Eastern church. The church had already undergone the Photian schism, which is the right, um, give me a sec. Yep, the right for the Byzantine emperor to appoint and dispose a patriarch without approval of the papacy, and the Hesychast controversy, the ascetic practice of contemplation to achieve inner tranquility and the ultimate knowledge of God. So the Western monastic traditions is different in the sense from the East that the Benedictines, sisters in Franciscans, Dominicans perhaps as well, they emphasize more on the preaching of God's works to the community and living a committed life, godly life by getting active, engaging and interacting with fellow Christians or even non-Christians in order to live a divine life, teaching the word of God in universities. It's different to the East, who em which emphasizes on ascetism, 
in order to form a better knowledge of God. So it was more about um, a doctrinal culture and linguistic difference. But we have a few which mark the schism, a few major points. First being the filioque controversy. Filioque is basically, basically means and to the son. The, West, the Western Church believes that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and to the Son, while the Eastern Church simply believes that the Holy Spirit proceeds only from God the Father. Second, we have the use of unleavened bread, which was prevalent in the West, but not in the East. Third, we have papal supremacy for the West over the patriarch of the East. The West believes that the Pope had the supreme authority, while the East believed in the Patriarch having more authority. So I just like to outline, sorry for the reflection. Um, I just like to outline a few reflections that I um, that I came up after reviewing my study in Christian history for the first 1,000 years. So really in the end, the question comes to, you know, our unexpectations perhaps, um, and the surprise that we just never know that, you know, who would have thought that the new Christians um, who appeared in the first to the second centuries, originally founded by a man called Jesus in Nazareth, would have claimed himself a savior to be a dominant, to form a dominant power or religion in the Middle Ages and throughout, adopted by the monarchs. Even. It was a religion that came from the gutter, adopted by the plebe plebeians undergoing executions, persecutions, but then survived, becoming a global world religion. The struggles the church endured during the persecutions, the barbarian invasions in the fourth century, Muslim invasions, to becoming a religion where, and forming the church, where, which is a disposal of all wealth and power allied with the Frankish Empire in the Middle Ages. It is something that the apostles, the church fathers and fellow Christians today would be proud of in establishing what is known as Christendom today. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I'll stop share now. So yeah, I really hope that you find that meaningful and hopefully you'd be able to reflect more about the Christian religion in general and what you think. Please like, subscribe, and comment on my posts, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Peace out.